Hi, this is Sadie Miller and you're listening to The Sirens of Audio. Nice bit of glitter there, Cyber Lieutenant. I bet you'll be lining up for the next remake of Time Lash. Keep my effing Cyber Lieutenant's name out of your effing mouth. I will, Cyber Leader, I will. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, I've just had my head blown off by the Cyber Leader. And the award for the best conversion goes to... Cyber Leader! I hope Doctor Who has me back. Because lack of emotion makes me do the craziest thing. G'day audiophiles, this is the Sirens of Audio, the podcast that explores the universe of Doctor Who and the audio medium. I'm Dwayne. And I'm Philip. G'day Dwayne, g'day audiophiles, and good day, Kenny. Good day, mate. How's it going? Ah, oh, you're getting better every time. Welcome back, Kenny. It's been far, far too long. It has. Thank you very much for having me back on. It's always a pleasure, and I will always make the time and space to join you guys on our exciting audio adventures. Mate, you're always welcome. Now, this is episode 101 of uh, the Sirens of Audio. So, we had a we've had a couple of doctors on the last couple of times, and we couldn't possibly follow it on with anyone else other than you, Kenny. <laughs> well, we well, have I'm one, that compliment. One famous. I can't lend you my doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you about that because not only have we had the privilege of speaking with a couple of doctors. Uh, recently and not so recently um you've had the opportunity to speak with uh, a doctor as well and particularly on the topic of your podcast pieces of eight tell us about your experience for those who haven't Absolutely. heard it already yeah that was um a little bit of serendipity because a couple of years ago paul mcgann was due to come up to scotland for a silent film festival in a wee place called bonus which is sort of on the it's on the coast of the River Forth, which of course you'll be familiar with through the Cybermen uh, going across there in Roy Gill's recent double of Eccleston Stories. And uh, he was coming to this film festival, but it got cancelled. But when it was rescheduled, they were planning to bring him back. And because I've been in touch with the PR girl quite a lot over the past couple of years, when they did online versions and kept highlighting it, I was number one in the list to get an interview with Paul when he came up. When... So I was able to get 20 minutes with them on Sunday, uh, just gone there, or this will be obviously a week past on Sunday for people listening as we chat now. And it was amazing. And incidentally, happy 100th episode. Congratulations. I know it is no easy feat getting there. So well done to the two of you and long may it continue. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So the interview with Paul, can we hear that on Pieces of Eighth or is it Scottish Field? Or is it both? I. It's, you can hear um, the non-Doctor Who stuff is on my work podcast, Scottish Field, and the same clip does appear in Pieces of Eight uh, when there's a full, pretty much a 20-minute chat with him. Sadly, I didn't get as long as I'd like to have done, but I had to narrow it down, because normally when I do an interview, I'm quite happy to just free flow it and see how it goes, because I usually yeah. know the, the beats that I want to hit. But because I knew I'd officially got 15 minutes, but pushed it to 20. Of course I'm going to push it to 20. It's Doctor Who, after all. And managed to get all my questions in. So I, I got my wee hit list of, of things to ask him there and managed to get just about everything in. So win. Yeah, it was the first time I'd ever met him. Um, it's bizarre considering, you know, he's been how long he's been around Big Finish and you know, I've been writing Big Finish stuff officially since uh, 2012. And that was, was the first time I'd actually had the chance to meet him and interview him. So it was uh, a bit of a dream come true. And he was absolutely manic. He was, if you think TV movie doctor, but if you'd given him some Lucasade or Gatorade or some sort of energy drink, I'd give him 10 Red Bulls. That's how he was. He was absolutely bouncing off the walls. He was in great form. And I'll give you some info that he that, that uh, isn't in pieces of eight. 
There you go, a wee exclusive for you. And I completely forgot to put it in, so you guys can have it. But when I went in, I was introduced to him. Um, he was behind this big wooden door, which I tweeted a picture of before I went in and didn't reveal who it was. And when I went in, it was just like this. It was like a baronial room, you know, with a big chair at the top of it, big wooden table. And Paul was sitting there at the top, just lounging in it, just looking so comfortable, very doctorish, just the way he was lounging around, you know, one leg over the arm. And uh, it was just this huge empty table. I said, hey, take a seat, uh, sit down there. I'm I'm just like Vladimir Putin. So sit down there at the bottom. And he made a joke of it. I, mean, I know it's serious stuff that's going on, but said, you know, we've got to make a wee joke about these things just now. So, yeah. yes. So I got to, I actually got to sit uh, beside him. It was about, about um, six, seven feet away from him. So it was good. Gotcha. Really good. Fantastic. It's a different experience to when I got to to meet him. I didn't sort of spend a great deal of time with him, but it was at an event in Melbourne, probably eight or nine years ago. And I found him to be kind of really chilled. He was just floating around the place, just chilled out. Mm. He wasn't manic at all. So, But he was surrounded by three other doctors. So perhaps he was sort of taking a bit of a back seat uh, with those other personalities around him as well. Who knows? Wow. As long as he's happy, and that's what we like. We like our happy doctors <laughs> around us. I remember after that Absolutely. event, going out with Colin and Sylvester, and um, we sort of said, go invite Paul as well, but Paul just wanted to go back to his room. So we, we had two doctors out for dinner with us that night. So could have had three, but never mind. Two out of three ain't bad, as somebody once said. Indeed. So today on the podcast, we're going to be talking about a recent Big Finish release, well, it's been recently released, but it was made a long, long time ago. And that is the latest Fourth Doctor release called Solo. I think it's Series 11, isn't it, Kenny? Series 11 of the Fourth Doctor Adventures? Yep. We are going to get into that in a moment. But before we do, you know what I see? Kenny, what? do you know what I see? Um, <laughs> Philip, do you know what I, I see? I am guessing. A, yeah. Is it a rabbit hole? It's a rabbit hole. Here we go. Me, me. <laughs> right, guys. I've got. To, I'm going to talk TV, the TV series today, because our, our topic of the Fourth Doctor series eleven relates very closely to the TV series, and I want to talk a bit about the Deadly Assassin, because I've heard people who. Uh, who often compare this era and the revelations that have come out in the current era on television have compared it back to The Deadly Assassin and how that was a massive, massive change to Doctor Who lore. And I've got to say, fellas, that I've always been one to sort of disagree with that. I don't think The Deadly Assassin was such a big change of lore as everyone seems to recall. Do you have any thoughts on that, Philip? Well, there were certainly some changes. I mean, the, the things that are similar are the Time Lords. So we've met the Time Lords before at length, I guess, in the Three Doctors and the War Games. So that's sort of where we'd seen them. We saw them as fairly straight-laced, fairly dull, boring people. Um, always male, so not quite sure how they populate, but <laughs> we see them there. And, 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 of course, briefly, do we see them in the Doomsday Weapon? My memory is of the book. Yes. And they, there's a big scene in the Doomsday Weapon. We do, Weapon. Colony in Space, yeah. Yeah, Colony in Space. Um, yeah, sorry. So I'm, I need to go to the Target novel. You're going Target books. I go Target because <laughs> to me that's that's that story is just all about Target. Um, and so we have a continuation in terms of what Gallifrey is like. There's new stuff entered. I mean, the the biggest new stuff is just an amazing set. Because I'm pretty sure that would have been who, who did the set design. That's um, Sega did the Ark in Space, but I've forgotten who. So James uh, Roger Murray Leach. Sorry, Roger Murray Leach. And so his, his set designs are spectacular, and then they end up becoming the norm for what Gallifrey would look like down the track. And, and they add the Matrix. Um, but I'm really not sure that there's that much added. Well, I, don't, I don't know. What do you think, Kenny? I am i don't think it was that seismic. I mean, yes, it shows that the Time Lords are not gods. It shows that they're just like us. In some ways, they're fallible. And, but they play politics. And, there's, and obviously, they're playing politics in the war games. And for me, I don't think it was that big a shift. I mean, yes, it, it does, but it, it, humanize them, it humanizes them a bit more, for want of a word, or, or since obviously Time Lords can't really be humanized, unless they're half human on their mother's side. And it's very, you know, I like it. I love the Deadly Assassin. I have no problems with, with that, because I think that it's pretty much keeping the Time Lord lore in place. 
and it's sort of expanding on it without actually reinventing the wheel. And I just find it hilarious when I read reviews. I've seen them in old fanzines from the 70s and people just going ape over them. I took out a naughty word there, self-censored before I said it. Yeah, people going ape over the Deadly Assassin and just outraged. And the fact that it came, I think it was bottom of the Doctor Who Appreciation Society poll that year. And it just proves to me that you should never really um, let Doctor Who fans have their opinions in these things because they'll just be, they'll be completely wrong. I think one of the great things Russell T did was get rid of them from the universe, get rid of the Time Lords, because after the Deadly Assassin, that was their peak. And then it's diminishing returns with the Invasion of Time and the Arc of Infinity. Yes, there's a slight improvement in Five Doctors, but that's because it's a celebration and we can forgive it for that. But really, getting rid of the Time Lords was one of the best things Doctor Who did because they are just, quite frankly, in my book, tedious, dull and boring. Do you agree with that sentiment, Philip? <laughs> um, I do think that most Gallifrey shows aren't worth watching. Oh, sorry, there's no, actually, I, oh, I love watching all Doctor Who. They're certainly not the high points. So you look at things like Invasion of Time, Arc of Infinity, and then into the new series. I think every time they start focusing on Time Lords, we just don't care. Russell, Russell T. Davis certainly had the right idea, which was we care about Earth stories, human stories. And so following them through, I think, was always more successful. I don't think we needed Gallifrey to come back. I don't think we needed it to come back and then be destroyed and then come back and be destroyed again. I think it's just getting ridiculous. But that being said, my one of my favourite series on, on audio is actually Gallifrey because it deals with politics and it's soap operish in its most lavish American dynasty sense. And for me, the, the first three seasons of Gallifrey are spectacular, but that's because it's about characters and people and politics, I think. What do you, what do you think about Gallifrey, Kenny? I love Gallifrey. Absolutely love it. It absolutely got me hooked because I remember buying the first CD of that with the thinking, mm, I'm not sure I'll like this. And I think I listened to it three times in three days because I enjoyed it so much. Love it on the audio. I love the audio stuff. I think that Gallifrey is a great series and it's you know very different eras and the different producers. You've got four different eras of Gallifrey on audio and I really enjoy all of those. But for me, just when they're on TV with the Doctor, it just slows things down. And it's the case of, mm, it's the Doctor. Oh, he's an errant one of us. We don't like him very much. And the Doctor is the greatest Time Lord of all. Sorry, Russell on. And I just think that it's, I just, on TV, it is just sort of, here are the people in big collars telling the Doctor what to do, even the doctors, even though the Doctor is better than all of them. So, no, I'm not a Time Lord fan on TV, really. How much Apart do you from love the Doctor. How much do you love the Time Lords, though, Dwayne? Okay, I'm, I'm a little bit different. I, I think the Deadly Assassin in particular introduced a richness to Gallifrey that is, oh, it's almost steampunk, isn't it? And it, if you look at the, the background behind me, that, that whole wooden style uh, of, of the Deadly Assassins always sparked my imagination. And not just the design of Gallifrey, but the personalities that were were introduced there before that they were always godlike and they were always a bit one note one dimensional personalities all the time lords that we saw prior to that except for the time lord in terror of the autons he was an interesting character although we only had him for a couple of minutes but the deadly assassin introduced these incredible incredibly interesting personalities into the mix councillor goth who you know, you, you think of Engen, think of Barusa, who was introduced there. And then in the Invasion of Time, that continued. We had the Castellan there, who was, you know, the Weasley kind of guy, who I always found an interesting personality. Barusa had regenerated, so that was interesting to see a regenerated character. Uh, the only other person who we'd seen regenerate before was the Master and the Doctor. So uh, to see an established character go on to regenerate into another another person was interesting in the, in the case of Barusa. Yeah, I think Ark of Infinity is probably the weakest of the Gallifrey set stories. Um, I've seen, I've I seen do, some. I do think four Bruce's and four stories is going a bit too far for regenerations, though. I mean, this poor guy, no wonder he goes around the twist in Five Doctors, having to regenerate every few years. Because yeah. <laughs> you know, what is happening on Gallifrey that is to keep regenerating over and over again? Yeah, that's right. And I do. I I was a little bit. Uh, miffed that when the series came back 
he was the last of the Time Lords. I didn't like that very much. So I was very excited as Gallifrey was coming back. But then I was let down again when Gallifrey got destroyed. And then when it was found again, destroyed again. I don't know how many times it's been now. I just find that really irritating. Because the other thing too is a Big Finish has proven that Gallifrey is a, a very interesting and engaging place. And lots of lots of things uh, can happen there. Uh, how many Gallifrey sets have we got? Uh, three, four, five, six, six, seven, eight. Oh, time eight, Wars, another four eight time series wars. plus time the wars. Time War. Time another War on top of that. Twin. And another one's about to come out with Louise as well. Another yeah, the War Room. That sounds like an interesting room. thing as well. So, uh, yeah, very, very, very rich, rich planet with, uh, with a history that uh, I love getting into, which is particularly why I enjoyed Blood of the Time Lords. So uh, maybe we should climb out of the rabbit hole and have a bit of a chat about that because it is a direct sequel to The Deadly Assassin. So uh, why don't I throw in a trailer for that and we'll come back and have a chat about it in a second. For all the grand titles, these are dark days. Another resident has been taken from us. Who would want to dispose of Time Lords who are already so close to death? From Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, The Fourth Doctor Adventures, Solo. No, 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 you can't do that. Don't stop it. Hello? Oh, hello. Pleased to meet you. I'm the... You can't park here. I'm so awfully sorry. I will... Well, you'll have to move it. Look! The flickering glow over there! And behind us, too. I'm very sorry, old Haku, but the fire appears to be growing all around us. My apologies, brothers. No matter. I heard word. Words reached me. A time capsule in the library. Doctor, this is important. I'm afraid it's unlikely to be dignified. I consider the implications, young man. Infinite library. An infinite fire. Doctor! Ancelon! How good to see you. Uh, I am to arrest you and have you escorted down to Gallifrey. <laughs> <laughs> Two residents down there, you say? Honourable Lorik. He's a crotchety old soul. An eminent Sedania. Sedania? Later the Prydonian Academy? <laughs> That's her. You won't want to get in her bad books. No talking at the back, please. Uh, yes, miss. Sorry, miss. May I ask a question, miss? You may not. Oh, well. I'm not afraid to say I often did. The doctor is on the stand. I know I have a habit of barging in just as everyone's vanishing or keeling over or a president's getting shot or whatnot. But trust me in this. I am innocent in dark times. Dark times. Well, I think this is excellent news. Okay, well, I'm hearing some, some weird noises down here. I uh, don't know if they're being picked up on the tape. And there's a light down the far end of the tunnel. Hello? Anyone down there? Hello? <coughs> What were we saying? Two members of personnel disappearing without a trace. Where do you think you're going, old girl? Huh? Where do you think you're going? Gordon Miles. I've heard him talking in the office. There have been sightings. Strange lights and... The witch. <laughs> have you ever seen her yourself? The stories go back a millennium at least. They wrote of a ghostly woman who would appear out to sea and along the shoreline. Over time, she acquired her name, the Ravencliff Witch. <gasps> what a place is that? <gasps> That's oh. the kitchen silence. Oh. Quickly! Oh. Oh. Doctor, what can we do? You want to speak with the witch? We're about to have a seance. The whole world is in danger. You must think I was born yesterday. Big finish for the love of stories. What exactly are you a scientist of, anyway? Oh, this and that. Well, that fills me with confidence. All right, so that was a trailer for uh, the Fourth Doctor Adventures Series 11 solo. First story that we're going to talk about is Blood of the Time Lords by Timothy X. Atak. And I'll read the blurb. From the website, it says the book known as the Discord Grimoire is an incredibly powerful tome believed capable of altering the true passage of time itself. And the doctor has it in the TARDIS. Wanting to, uh, to sorry, wanting to look into this mysterious opus further, he decides to take it to an old friend 
the Recusary, a monastery-like retreat on a moon of Gallifrey. But he's chosen an inauspicious time to arrive. Something else is visiting the Recusary, and this something hasn't brought a book with it, but death. So I found this story fascinating from, from start to finish. As I said, I, I really enjoy getting into Time Lord Society and Gallifrey itself. So, uh, so Kenny, what was your initial impressions of the story? Well, I was quite impressed because uh, obviously I knew a wee bit about it from having done the Vortex preview. And the fact it's set on one of Gallifrey's moons makes it straight away a slightly more familiar but different setting, which I thought was a really nice touch. So we don't, and it also covers the need for the fact that we don't have characters like Hengen and Spandrel around. And it's sort of, so that's that covered. But it's, it's, I think just we've given that we've just had a whole load of you know new Time Lord lore, it's quite nice to get a little bit more here. I think it, it's a great setting. I mean, I think um, anybody who's a Doctor Who fan more than likely has the element of the collector about them and likes to buy physical media and keep it in place. And I know that that's definitely me. So I like you're know, keeping everything in place in its right order. So I really enjoyed that. There's some great characters in there. Um, I think you know, there's some some nice little continuity nods, particularly when we find out who it is that's in charge. That um, I think we're basically being told us it's Campo, isn't it? Without it being actually using the name Campo, yeah. and as a doctor's old teacher, and some very very interesting characters. And I love the whole idea of the cohorts as well. The fact they've got wooden masks on and hearing them move around, which is a great bit of a great idea, particularly for sound design as it does give them that sort of um, library kind of feel to them. You can just imagine them with um, like a dark sort of wooden mask on and creaking as they move. I do like that. Great characters, full of life. And of course, there is a little bit of mystery and you think, who's behind the killings? Particularly when we get that great cliffhanger when the Doctor steps forward and admits he's the one who's done the killings. And you definitely didn't see that one coming. What about yourself? What did you find about how did you find it? Philip? You know, it's interesting because the last Philip Hinchcliffe box that came out, I didn't think felt very Philip Hinchcliffe. And then when this started, the first 15 minutes, it made me feel exactly like we're back in the Bob Holmes Hinchcliffe era. era. The dialogue, the setting, the mystery. Um, there's certainly very strong parallels with Deadly Assassin. I mean, Deadly Assassin is building up Yes, yeah. I hope, hope people have listened to this because otherwise spoilers galore. Um, but Deadly Assassin builds up to the Doctor doing an assassination at the end of the first episode. It's such a major shock that it, what you can't believe is going is happening is actually happening. And then you've almost got the similar situation in the first episode where you've got this build up, build up, build up, and then suddenly this major behaviour act thing happens with the, the Doctor, the fourth Doctor which is just, you can't believe it. It's, it's a total shock. Almost as big as, as shooting at the President is what, what you know, the fourth Doctor reveals at the end of the, uh, in the in that first episode. So it's a beautiful, brilliant cliffhanger, which just leaves you wanting more. So that, that first episode, the pacing of it, the way it's built up, the casting is spectacular. Um, there's you know, so many people in there that I love and really love the distinctiveness of the voices. And I think that's part of the richness of this, this this episode is the fact that the voices are so rich and so distinct, uh, and that just makes it all the more powerful. So, yeah, well acted. Um, interesting, a few people who are going to come back uh, and be, play a bigger role in Big Finish. This is because I don't know where this was actually recorded. Um, this would have been quite a long time ago. 2017. 2017. Almost five years ago. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah, so th th this has been sitting there for five years, and a lot of the cast who are in this had not, not anything, and they're going to come back and become major companions for one of them so you know, this is the, the time when they first made an impression obviously they got on well with tom um so just in terms of you know, casting there um of course i'm talking about um chris vanela who has got a huge role in this but he's going to be recast as harry sullivan so obviously this was sort of the beginning of his relationship with tom and when you know when big finish finds people that tom works well with they find ways of bringing them back Jane Slavin, of course, is in the every Tom Baker show because the two of them just click really well. Once again, it's not a major role she's got, um, roles she has, but she's still very distinctive. She, you know, she, she can just do anything. So there's, there's these really strong underlying cast members. Um, and then, you know, and at Badland, who 
I just love and adore. We've had on the program. She's utterly mad and crazy. And she does a lovely character piece here where you're never quite sure where she's coming from. So, yeah. As she always does. As she always does. Um, let, let me give you my views on, on the story. It, it, it was that Gallifreyan richness that really stuck out to me here. And I've got to tell you, Kenny, I... I tweeted my thoughts on this the other day, and I hadn't yet read your piece in Vortex magazine, so don't uh, don't scold me too much. I'm sorry. But <laughs> I tweeted out that this reminded me very much of The Name of the Rose. I love that movie, in particular the Sean Connery version, although the miniseries that was a few years ago was pretty good too. But I certainly got a sense of inspiration from that particular story in this. I loved... Also, the there's some quite some unusual named characters as well. Um, the the cohorts they kind of reminded me a little bit of the is it the drudges that Mark Platts uh, invented for? Oh, that was Nick Nick had the drudges in uh, audio visuals and sounds of time. What was, what was it? Mark's got the he's got badger. Oh, and, it goes uh, goes way back. Yeah, yeah. So there's there's characters that remind me of of those. But I was. Certainly, having read Lung Barrow recently, I was certainly hit with lots of familiar Lung Barrow-like um, atmospheric uh, placements throughout the story. Um, and I was wondering if um, Tim had uh, drawn from Lung Barrow as well. So, and, and I, I'm not a real big fan of Lung Barrow myself. I find that a really hard book to read. Uh, I find it uh, a difficult one. Um, I got a much better appreciation of it more recently when I the, the guys from the Doctor Who show did an episode on Lung Barrow, and I, I sort of read two-thirds of it, given up again, and listened to their episode of, of their review of Lung Barrow, and I got a better appreciation of it that way. So uh, certainly um, the richness comes through in the script for Gallifrey in this story. So we've talked about some of the cast. Yes, Annette Badland is fantastic. I want to mention James Dreyfus as the master because I've enjoyed his master throughout the, the previous stories. He's, he's, we've had him in stories with um, the seventh doctor, the second doctor, I think the first doctor, first David doctor. Bradley as well. Yep. So how many altogether, Kenny? Do you know? That's four. Many? He's done four altogether. He's, he's so done this four? This is the last one to be released now, yep. Yeah, and I, I, he's sort of hit the note really well with the master in this. Um, so I think... He was a great choice to be cast as the master. I don't know what you guys think about this. I think in this story, it's probably his best performance. I think he plays a very cold and detached master who's quite clinical, cynical, and just downright. There's no thrills to him. There's no charm. He's very much an analytical mind who has his goals and sets about what he wants to achieve them. And it's a very, I think it is actually a very clever performance. His, because when you hear his normal speaking voice, there's quite a lot of vocal inflection and character to it. But here he's taken all of that out and plays it almost flat. But it's an evil flat and it's, it's very, very difficult to do. If you've ever tried to do that, to, even just to speak a normal sentence, I mean, particularly for, for Aussies, where you like to go up at the end of your sentence and... Uh, it's a very, very tough thing to do, to, to kill that vocal. And I think he's, in fact, well, he does give two very, very different performances in the story. Are we allowed to say that? Give away the spoiler. Yeah, I think we'll just have to warn people of the spoilers. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Well, here's a spoilery bit, um, because we get to find out that the Master is, in fact, playing one of the elderly Time Lords, whose name is, was on my other computer, and I've not, I can't access it now, old... Oh, what's his name? Can anybody remember? No, it's not, it's not listed the cast list with the other name, which is a shame because often they're both there, but it's not here. Yeah, they've not given that one away. No, but I, 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 actually, I did actually miss that along the way. It wasn't until he changed over that I went, oh, okay. So I, it was the reveal, which I had missed along the way. So it's always good when you don't recognize the master in disguise. And this, because I didn't, I think, I think you're spot on in terms of his um, performance because he's just so evil. In fact, I think this is the most evil the Master has been. And he and Tom, James and Tom, work so well together. And it's interesting, that, you know, there's all these hints about their history and their past. And of course, you know, this is an, the earliest incarnation of the Master we have seen. 
Um, oh no, actually, our Trin Masterful we've seen an earlier one. So that is supposed to be the second or the third incarnation, but it's the one. Be it looks like it's the one before Roger Delgado's Master. And so Tom, of course, is known and he's only just defeated and thinks he's dead. Oh, well, thinks he's dead. Um, so he actually sort of knows the end of the Master's life from the previous story. So he knows what's happening here, and the Master has an inkling that Tom knows this. But a lot of the stuff they talk about their time at the Academy and things that they did together, and in fact, a lot of this whole master plan that the master got in action is because of things that the Doctor has taught him earlier on. And so it's interesting seeing two people closer to the time of when they were friends and how they've, how they've changed different parts. And James Trafus, I think, just nails, nails the part brilliantly. Yeah, absolutely. And it is actually mentioned in the, the story itself. I think the Doctor mentions it, that this is the most... Um, evil incarnation of the master because he's a he's a child and he's like a child in a with no control, so that's what makes him so terrifying. Um, and he, I think he says that in the script somewhere. But um, interesting as well. I'm I, I'm not going to spoil it, but there is reference to how the Doctor and the Master get their names, the Doctor and Master, which I think it was really really satisfying. And I thought, oh. That's very simple. That's very, very satisfying. That's that's revealing something that we previously didn't know, but not destroying the whole show, if you know what I mean. Yeah. That was just a little bit of reveal, and I thought, yes, this is the way things need to be done in, in terms of storytelling. I really enjoyed that aspect of it, too. And, all, and also why no one knows what their names are now. Yes, Give yes. Fantastic. So it, yeah, and once again, it doesn't doesn't change anything, doesn't change the whole time law or the Doctor's history, but it's just a little throwaway that you can go, ah, oh, and then just makes you smile if you understand it. Very, good. Very much so. I think, I mean, also, I did not see James Dreyfus's appearance coming or the unveiling of the Master. I had not picked up on that at all. Alistair Dewar, the, the wonderful, lovely fellow who makes those action figures for us, he spotted it. And he texted me to say, I knew it was him all along. And uh, so he was the master all the time. But I didn't see it coming. So I I was quite, oh, so I was quite pleased with that, the fact that I didn't see it. And I think Timothy Atak is such a wonderful, wonderful, clever writer. He crafts worlds and believable characters, uh, engaging characters as well, who you... You want to know what happens to them and go with them on their journey. Oh, gosh, I said journey. That's so pretentious. But you know what I mean? There's, there's so much there to enjoy. And I, it's a very rich, colourful story. And it's definitely all made in, to my mind, yes, it all looks like the the fourth Doctor's secondary console room. Just that sort of dark wood and glass, sort of churchy kind of feel to it. Yeah. I was going to say, well, this will be the first story that Timothy... Uh... Was it Timothy X Attack? Is that how you pronounce it? Timothy X Attack. Timothy, Timothy X Attack. Attack. Because um, he's, only, he's only written, what, one, two, three, four, five, or six six stories so far. Um, and this was probably, what well, may have been the first one he wrote. Probably so he, was, if it was five see, years ago. When The Wreck of the World. So The Wreck of the World was 2017 as well, which was the um, early adventures with Jamie and Zoe. So, so this was written about the same time. Is that? But he, he doesn't do a lot, but what he does is very interesting. Well, you mentioned the, the TARDIS console room. Let's talk about that for a second, because we've got Nicholas Briggs doing the direction on this, and we've got the sound design and music by Jamie Robertson. So I know Nick is very, very... Um, he has a lot of attention to detail when it comes to recreating the sounds. So he may have given Jamie lots of notes, unless Jamie's just very clever anyway, which no doubt he is. But to get those console room, console room sounds uh, in both stories that we're going to talk about tonight, um, I was taken right back to that console room. And I really felt that I was on a Gallifreyan moon. I thought it was absolutely incredible the way the sound design was done in this. And I see Jamie's name more and more. I know he's been around for a long, long time, hasn't he, Kenny? And he's pretty much doing all the fourth Doctor stuff these days. Uh, getting you right. know, he's been. I think he's been doing them pretty much since season two. He's pretty much been given these to do single handedly. So there's wonderful wee things that you like when canines in a story. There's a little variation in the canine and theme, canine and company theme tune. 
Yeah. Uh, which you can hear quite subtly. And it's wonderful. It's it's not it's a homage without being a copy. And I think Jimmy's wonderful what he does. He's a very talented musician, great with a guitar. And he's uh, appearing in an upcoming episode of Pieces of Eighth, which I'll just get a wee plug in for now, <laughs> which will be in a couple of weeks' time when we're chatting about the Silver Turk. Um, uh, you've, you've, you've beat us to him. Oh, oh, we've we had him at Christmas time as well. We had him in Christmas Eve for our Christmas mm. party. Uh, but Jimmy's wonderful. He's a very, very humble guy, very talented. And what he does is, is just great. It really, I, I think sometimes people can easily overlook the importance of sound design and music in these releases. And Jamie's got a very distinctive style. And I would know his music when I, if I heard it and thought, yep, just because there's just wee, wee things when you listen to a lot of their work, you recognise the composers, little motifs that they have. And Jamie is, is just one of the best. Okay. Did we have any final thoughts on this particular story before we move on? It's my favourite tone we've had for a couple of seasons. Yes. Yes, this so, is so really this, this, so some one off, this is some one-off toms I've loved in terms of the seasons. This has been my favourite one, probably since the Jane Slaven season, actually. So, so that brings me to the next question. How do we all feel about the Doctor being companionless? This was inspired by Tom Baker's own desire after Elizabeth Sladen left to ha- ha- be companionless for a while. So they've gone and taken the idea and turned it into a big finish series or two. So how do you, how do you feel about this, Kenny? Well, I'm just missing the talking cabbage, but other than that, <laughs> I, I think it's, it's great. I mean, we've got quite a lot of the other doctors. We've had them travelling solo, even the fifth doctor who didn't have any obvious gaps in which he would have, but Big Finish managed to create them, and I really enjoy them. I think it's quite. It gives it, it gives you a chance to see the doctor through other people's eyes, and he's he's quite nice for me. Sometimes he's trying to show off and impress a wee bit just to, to show to new people, so, hello, I'm the Doctor, this is what I do. And building up new dynamic relationships as well with others. And I quite, I quite enjoy that. I'm quite happy when he's travelling solo just for short periods of time and picking up new friends and meeting them, and then off he goes at the end. I think it's perfect for audio, because to be able to have that monologue talking to yourself, well, that's what audio is made for. If he was talking to himself on the TV screen all the time, that'd seem a little bit weird. But in this medium, I think it works absolutely perfectly. And we've had some quite successful stories with other doctors on their own as well throughout the Big Finish years. So, yeah, does, I think he, it works he, he, extremely well. He does make fun of talking to himself, though, which is part of what's so amusing. Is in in yes. both stories, he has a little go at talking to himself. I think, I mean, as I said, this might be the first series that they've put together as a solo. But Tom has had lots of solo outings throughout Big Finish now because he, he pops up in all over the place, doesn't he? So it's, it's not like these are the only episodes and stories we're getting of him. So I think we often see him solo. Um, yeah, and I think I think people often forget the changing nature of television. So when, when the show started, the Doctor needed three other companions because you know, they needed to have people on different sets and because they were filming it basically live, you know, you, you couldn't have people walk from set to set. You didn't have cuts and so you needed to have enough different storylines happening to be able to go from one to another to another and keep the story going. Um, as of course, once they started filming, te- filming techniques changed, particularly when it went to colour, well, you only need one companion then. And so, you know, you, you, you adapted to what, what you had. And so in terms of audio, yeah, I think you're right. It, does, it doesn't really matter. But that being said, we do build a particular warmth to, to the companions. And, you know, I still think that, you know, when you've got the right companion beside the Doctor, you know, the Eighth Doctor, so much of... The Eighth Doctor's love is because of Charlie, because of Lucy. Um, you know, the Colin, Colin was redeemed because of Evelyn. So, you know, what Big Finish have done with Companions has actually given us a greater insight of the Doctors. And, you know, I think Tom, I think Tom and Louise work really well together. The, the Mary Tam season with Tom was wonderful. It's just extraordinary and so sad we lost her um, straight away. And, of course, you know, we lost Elizabeth far too early too, so she couldn't do any seasons with Tom. Um, but there still is something just magical about Tom with one of his, you know, really it's just Louise now. Um, yeah, it looks like, I'm assuming we're going to get some seasons with Sadie and Harry coming up. I don't think, don't think it's been announced, but I'm just guessing that's what's happening. Like, they'd be mad not to do that. But, you know, it's probably not for another four or five years um, when they come out. 
Um, but yeah, there's sort of a special place for companions. Well, speaking of companions, uh, the Doctor's still on his own here, and even in the next story that we're going to talk about, he's on his own. But there is a someone who's going to end up being a companion. It's been announced recently. So let's have a chat about that. The Ravencliff Witch, written by David Llewellyn. I'll just read the blurb for that story. Uh, The TARDIS lands in Ravencliff, a small town on the English coast that stands in the shade of a newly built power station. And that just happens to be haunted. Every now and then, a spectral figure is glimpsed on the beach, the Ravencliff Witch. And every time she appears, it's the prelude to disaster. The Doctor has to solve the mystery of her appearances if he wants to prevent a catastrophe. But he won't have to do it alone, as he has the help of Margaret Hopwood, a renowned sculptor destined to play a big part in his life. Even more than we think, Kenny. What were your thoughts on the story? Well, this is a story that I'm an absolute sucker for, this kind of setting, when you've got a location. It's it's just such a Doctor Who location, a village, an isolated village on the coast. There's a new power station there. I mean, it's pretty much the classic, almost a Pertwee kind of setting with a bit of Tom thrown in there. And it's just such a wonderful mix. You've got larger-than-life characters, again, who make a real impression very, very quickly. And, of course, there's the supernatural element because that's the sort of thing that we quite like in Doctor Who with the image of the Vendal and the likes. I think, is it magic? Is it magic? Can it be magic? Of course it's not. It's science. It's Doctor Who. There's always a scientific rationale for the mysterious goings-on. But I think we're introduced to interesting characters, the fact that we've got a power station and things are happening there. And the rather unlikable Gordon Miles, who's in charge of it, played by the wonderful Richard Darrell, better known to us as Dr. Watson from Big Finish's Sherlock Holmes. And I think he makes him to such a dislikable, reprehensible scumbag. And um, it, it does, it really gives you that. You've, the fact you've got who the obvious enemy is, or is he? But no, he's just uh, he's just an overzealous person who likes to work to the book. But of course, we're finding there's lots of dark energies and things being worked on, and there's an alien influence from a ship that crashed in the sea many moons before, or many years before, not just moons. I suppose technically both are right. And it just there's great characters there. We've got setting with the lighthouse, Trevor Cooper playing Silas Keynes. And we instantly take a light to him, but I think we all know very quickly he's not going to survive, is he? People in lighthouses tend not to live long in Doctor Who. <laughs> and uh, Amanda Keane's his daughter, played by Delly Siegel, or Segal, and she's very good as well. But I think that uh, the, one of the real stars of the show, though, is Emma Knox's Eleonora. I think she's playing the sort of the main scientific type lady there at the base, and or at the base the scientific um, nuclear, the, the research station. Oh, what am I saying? It's too early in the morning for power me. Power station, power station. Power <laughs> station, it's a power station. How can I forget the power station? It's the same name as the Blooming Band with Paul Weller. Yes, it's uh, the power stations. That is, and again, it's a great setting. We were all used to these from the likes of Hand of Fear. There's just, there's an awful lot going on. And I think the pacing of it is great. There's some good It's a hybrid hangers. of Hand of Fear and the Android Invasion. That yes, really- that's it. That's it exactly. That's it exactly. And it's and such rock. a good mix. <laughs> okay, with a little bit of fang rock in the outskirts. <laughs> but surely, though, if you're going to do that kind of Doctor Who story, then you might as well just take elements from the best, because that's what they did when they were making it at the time, taking exactly. from the best horror films. So why not pick and choose from the best Doctor Who stories? And there's wonderful elements all there, and it forms something rather special. I haven't mentioned Margaret yet, but I'm sure we'll come on to her shortly. Yeah, absolutely. That the hybrid of uh, hybrid of those two stories that I just mentioned, and you can you can certainly feel with these two stories that they would fit in season fourteen perfectly. And that's I think a lot of that is down to Nick Briggs's direction because he, as I said, he's got attention to detail. He likes to recreate eras. Uh, that's what I've noticed anyway. So um, I think it would have fit perfectly in this season. Philip, what were your thoughts on the story? Yeah, I mean, I, all the locations are such a typical Doctor Who location. It, it, it feels like a mishmash, but it really works well. So I think that was just, yeah, the, the lighthouse. And I guess they're all such strong images. To me, it was a bit of green death, actually, in terms of the 
power station and those sort of things. So there's, it actually covered in lots of different eras. One of the things that the Tom Baker, the Fourth Doctor stories let you do, is because Tom and the Fourth Doctor is larger than life, you need characters that match it. And so what these stories allow you to do is have bigger and more ridiculously large characters who, you, who couldn't exist in real life. They're too big. But then Tom's too big in real life as well. Like, you, you couldn't use these characters in a Peter Davidson story. It would it'll just be overwhelming. And so what, what these writers are doing is they're just pitching it perfectly for who Tom is, how Tom acts, and how he responds to people. And so, you know, the villain is, you know, a slightly over-the-top villain, but it needs to be to, to match Tom and, and his bigness. And so every character here has these moments. And then, you, I, I think you're right, I think Emma Noakes and, and um, Deli Seagal both give much more subtle performances. And because of that, they're so much more immediately likable. Um, they're quite different and distinct, but, but you actually have a fondness for them that, that happens because of, of the fact that they're, they're softer. Um, and I will m mention there is Hughes, of course, you know, first came in, in Kinder, and um, you know, so a very, very famous um, British actress. But, you know, and she just plays really wonderfully off Tom. Now, you, you mentioned, that, is she doing a whole series with Tom coming up? Is that the story, or is this the one? It is the story. Yeah, she's apparently going to be joining, she's joining the fourth Doctor and Leela. Is that right? That's the case. Yes, very much so. They're going to be <laughs> going off and having more adventures further down the line. Um, one of my friends has written one of these stories, and uh, that's where I, when he was working on something and I first found out that she was coming back. So that's quite exciting. I just realised a wee minute or two ago, I said Emma Noakes playing Eleonora. I actually meant Lucy Piggles. Piggles? Pickles as Celia Banks, as the chief scientific type person. Oh, I was going to say, Eleanor is in the other story, isn't it? Yes, I, I just realised that I said that. I've been looking at the cast list going, is something wrong with my cast list here? Can I, I, can I say, one, one of the big whinges I'm, I'm going to have about the cast listing at the moment and the box sets is that they don't separate the cast out for each story. I'm, I'm really not liking that on the website because you really have to struggle hard to work out who's in which story and where they match up and, and things. So big finish if you're listening. Um, I think we actually need cast lists for each story in a box set because I want to be able to find out who was in what box set and where they're playing, etc. So, Yeah, because I'm yeah. looking at the separate releases on the website, which you do, if you buy the box set on the app, you don't get that. That's a sensible thing to do. I should have done that. You're a smart man. That's what you do. <laughs> um, whenever I see David Llewellyn's name on a script, he's one of these really established big Finnish writers now who, whenever I see his name, I go, yes, this is, I don't have any question in my mind that uh, it's going to be a good one. And this is good as well. So it's got the, I couldn't work out when it was set though, because she's talking about her parents being there before World War One. What, what, what was the setting? I, ca I can't remember what think, it was, the, the time late, period. I think it's late seventies, early eighties is is the feeling right. I guess. That's what I thought. I okay. think, I think it's in line with the show. Which is not contemporary anymore, is it? It feels like it's contemporary. It doesn't feel that long ago, the 70s and 80s, but it was. <laughs> it was. Coming up for 50 odd years. How can that be? Yeah, so it's got that contemporary setting, but it's got these really epic sci-fi themes uh, coming out towards the end of it to, to resolve the story. And I really like that. And, and David Llewellyn, I can never... I never pick his stories. He's very versatile uh, in his storytelling, so I, I think that's a good a good thing. Um, let's talk about some of the cast, which you've already mentioned a few. Now, um, Neris Hughes, of course, we've talked about her, but Trevor Cooper, I love his voice on audio. There's just something about it. I've always loved everything. I love the Big Finish Star Cops series for him. Uh, oh, I like them. I like them all, but I love hearing his voice, and I particularly fell in love with his voice on audio in the Caldor City series. He had a great role in that. Yep. So, uh, the, uh, although this was recorded five years ago, I don't know what he's doing these days, whether he's still still acting or not, but uh, I, yes, Kenny? I think he's still carrying on, yes, because he's still doing Star Cops with still uh, Anderson. Yeah, still been, when he turns up, he's always wearing a Star Cops t-shirt. And yep. it always, has, it oh, always cool. has a different one every single time. No two days have been the same. So that shows you there's a hell of a lot of Star Cops t-shirts out there. And I hadn't looked at the cast list before I started listening. And I, the, the character of Gordon Miles, I thought, I've heard that voice somewhere before. 
So of course he's already been mentioned, Richard uh, Richard Earl, mm. uh, as the uh, the voice of Watson with Nicholas Briggs as Sherlock Holmes. So five years ago they were probably doing some Sherlock Holmes around that time, weren't they? So they were probably think- doing a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, well, they're, they're, they're still doing the stuff now because they, mm. the last release won the um, Audi, Audi Award, which is a pretty huge feather in Big Finish's cap because I think it's two years in a row now they've won the Audi. Um, yeah, which is, yeah, is it won, two years in a row? I'm pretty sure they nice won. Nice one. I think last year they won with won the Stranded Stories, if I remember correctly. Oh, Stranded Stranded sorry. Points, when, yeah. sorry, yep. So, yeah, they're, they're doing remarkably well in terms of what they're releasing. It's being recognised internationally as the best of the best. Particularly when you see who they're beating, but when you've got, you know, actors have been in huge American series as well. Yeah. With your know, major casts and here's Nicholas Briggs, Richard Errol and Lucy Briggs Owen getting <laughs> a win in a, in a script written by by David Barnes. So yeah, it was fab. Did I say David, it is David Barnes, isn't it? I think it is, yeah, for that one. Let's let's talk about the artwork. Because I think the artwork on this is spectacular. Uh, Ryan Applin is the artist. I'm not sure how much he's doing. Is he doing a lot at the moment? He's got the older style. We've got that sort of sort of painted look on a lot of the covers at the moment. That's not him. But I really love Tom Baker's Deadly Assassin shirt featuring on both these releases. And um, I think I can see on Philip's background, TARDIS interior. Um, some sort of stained glass there. Really, really nice. Yep. Stuff. So I think the artwork, even though I st- I get everything on download now, the artwork to me is very, very important. And I think Ryan does a great job on most things that he does, especially this one. Yeah, absolutely. I think the the artists, everybody, everybody's got their different styles. And, you know, there's some some series lend themselves, to, for example, Stranded and Unit have the lineups. Whereas something like this, where it's one or two regulars, you can have that bit more freedom to be a bit more creative. And I just think, I mean, the overall cover for the whole box set is great. And then the two individual ones, they're just beautiful. Yeah. They're, they're, I mean, the sort of thing that you could imagine having in a calendar. Couldn't you use a bit of calendar art? Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. That's what Big Finish should do. Do some calendars. That's what they used to do. The Big Finish calendar, did they? Did they? I didn't know they used that. to do des- little desktop calendars um, back in the days with Clayton Hickman's artwork. I think it was stuff up to, um, oh, Craig, it must have been about... Release number 40. So I've still got the calendar somewhere. I really should scan it and get some nice clean artwork just for my archive. Well, that'd be collectible these days, wouldn't it? I'd imagine it would be. There you go. Um, Interesting on the sound design on this one. Did we say Jonathan Barnes before wrote? David David Barnes. Sorry, I meant Jonathan. Yes, Jonathan Barnes wrote the um, Sherlock Holmes. Thanks, Phil, for the correction. We like to yes, get things I'm right. Having one of those, <laughs> I'm having one of those mornings. My head is a thousand and one places, as you know, from my stupid computer not working and having to do this episode on my mobile phone or cell phone if you're in America. Would you guys say mobile or cell phone? Mobile. Mobile. Excellent. Yep. See, you guys are more cultured than the Yanks. Exactly. I'm joking, hey, Americans. <laughs> that's quite of our audience. I'm joking. You the, you and the uh, Scots are more cultured than the English, <laughs> I hear. Well, that's because um, we smash people up, so yes. <laughs> <laughs> I could point out, I am joking. Interesting on the sound design on this story, it's been split up. So Jamie Robertson did the music only on this with to- uh, Toby Robinson doing the sound design. So he's the owner of Moat Studios, isn't he? Yeah. So he did the sound design on that. So he does a few things from time to time and uh, works just as well on both. I did notice on this one in particular some uh, some Dudley Simpson tropes in there, which I really enjoyed. I love yes. that. Love going back to that. So uh, overall, I think uh, it worked really well. What are your thoughts on Margaret? Uh, as the, Well, she's the faux companion for this one. Uh, but as we now, now know, she is going to be joining as a regular in a forthcoming season. So, Philip, what are your thoughts on uh, on Margaret as a companion? Well, I'm really, I'm really not sure. I mean, I think, I think she was a great guest cast person, and I certainly enjoyed. It. I mean, to me, she's not the one. I, she's not the one I would have picked um, out of the cast to turn into a companion. Um, but that being said, I mean, she's a brilliant actress and very entertaining. So it's quirky. I mean, it's going to be interesting to see. I mean, I love there was a little mention of the Braxitel collection about the, the Doctor seeing one of her works yes. in the Braxitel collection. 
Yeah. And um, that just made me smile. You know, both City of Death reference, of course, but for those of you who follow the Bing Summerfield series, like I do, uh, the, the Brax collection is my, my, it's my favorite place to be for the Bing Summerfield stories, both the novels and the stories that happen in the collection are the ones I love because of, I just love the cast. I love the ensemble that are there. And so that, that throwaway line was nice. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing what they do with a artist's companion. I'm more intrigued by the fact she's traveling with Leela as well. So I don't know whether the, the, you know, the doctor comes and picks her up and then leaves with the TARDIS while he does Face of Evil. And then <laughs> who knows? So I think I think her and Leela actually together will be fascinating. It's an interesting we- dynamic. I'm, I'm thinking the exact same thing because it's been a while since we've had an older companion. So have we had anyone older since Evelyn? Can you think of anyone? I can't. No, no, no. Not 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 no, this I'm old anyway. So, no, racking my brains and nobody springs to mind. I think the dynamic's going to be very very interesting because because Evelyn works so well, but she was working well alone with the Doctor, uh, apart from Brewster from time to time. But you know that was still in a sort of a grandmotherly way. Where um, this, I don't know. I don't know where in. Uh, in the in the in the history of the fourth doctor and Leela, Margaret's going to join. Whether she's still in the uh, Eliza Doolittle stage, and maybe she's going to try and turn Leela into a lady. Who knows? I don't know. But she doesn't. Who knows? I don't know what they're going to do with it. But um, it's certainly going to be very very interesting. And she's so very humorous. The, the scene that happens at her cottage where they're all being attacked by different animals and the cat flap and the the dialogue there between her and um, Trevor Cooper. The, the two of them are playing beautifully off each other. I guess part of it, I don't, didn't feel like she had that much time with Tom, but certainly how she was playing with other characters. I mean, she, yeah, there was a, a, a lovely performance there, a lovely lightness of touch, but some great humour. And so, they, yeah, I think her and Tom could spark really well with, with the right writing. Yeah, I think there's yeah. a lot of potential there. I think the fact that Neris Hughes has got great comedy timing and she can do the gravity as well. And I think that will make for quite an interesting mix, particularly with Leela, as to how Leela, as you say, will interact with her. I mean, I would imagine it will be set perhaps, you know, before K-9 joins and it'll be in that sort of wee gap between seasons 14 and 15, where Big Finish have put in quite a few stories already. So I'd imagine it'll probably fit on the tail end of those. Yeah. Very good. So any final thoughts on the box set, Fourth Doctor Adventures, Series 11, Solo, Philip. Best box set for a long time. Super enjoyable. Really feels the tone of, the, of that period, but also has modern stories and modern things to say. So, yeah, really, really worth listening to and getting. Kenny? Yeah, I agree. I think it's great. It, there's just so much going on. There's two very different types of story here. So depending on your mood, if you're feeling a bit fannish and want something that will appeal to your love of Doctor Who and Time Lord lore, there you go. But if you want something that is very much a traditional Tom Baker type season 13, season 14 kind of story, then you're going to be more than happy with the Ravencliff Witch, which is a brilliant title as well. I don't know what the original title was. It's mentioned in the extras. It had another title. But I think the Ravencliff Witch does grab you, doesn't it? It's just it such does. a great name. And, and obviously, yeah. um, Nicholas Briggs is not shy in saying it, it was his title or his suggestion to change the title. And I think he's right. It, it is just the perfect, perfect um, um, Tom Baker story title. Dwayne, your last thoughts? No, very excited. Just like you, Philip, I think it's the best fourth Doctor in a couple of years. So um, I'm looking forward to what's to come. And, and, and on that... It's recently been announced that the Doctor's solo adventures are continuing in a box set called The Nine. So that's very exciting. Who plays The Nine? I can't remember, Kenny. John? That's John Heffernan. Right, 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 right. So that should be uh, that should be good. I love that character. One of the most interesting characters that Big Finish has created. Uh, originally was The Eleven. But then uh, as we've been going through the various incarnations... We're getting to know some of the others a bit more, and the Nine is going to be facing off against the Fourth Doctor. So that should be good. Yep, I've just been working on the Vortex preview for that, and it's actually got me really excited. I think he's just in the first story, but it's going to be really good fun. And it's, it's just a, it's such a great character. The fact he's a kleptomaniac and is just determined to get his own way and collect everything, given that the, the Eight lived a life of 
Solitude and uh, as a monk, he didn't have many worldly possessions. So you've got the nine who's the complete opposite of him. Mm. And I think that's going to make for quite an interesting encounter with the fourth doctor. I would love to see the sixth in Torchwood. The sixth is the murder. Oh, he, yeah, he's, yeah. he's the murder one, isn't he? I think the sixth in yeah. Torchwood would be fantastic. If we ever need to recast the six for whatever reason, Kenny can do a good six. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> I think um, I've got. Uh, I always thought that uh, Robert Carlyle would have made quite a good six. You know, sort of that sort of train spotting big, big kind of feel to him. So I think. But then again, they probably surprise us and cast a female six and give us the complete opposite of what you expect. So yeah, that would be they, quite they have, They've never cast a six, have they? No, never had. No. That's right. What am I talking about recasting the six? It hasn't yeah, even he, been cast. No, Kenny, it's all yours. He's so well played. <laughs> Excellent! I mean, <laughs> but yeah, I just think, I think the six in Torchwood, um, you could do a box set and it would be terrifying. Like Jack the Ripper on Earth, be, you know, hunting down the Torchwood team. I think it could be, yeah. So Big Fit, if you're listening, that's my uh, go for it. Very good. Okay. Let's uh, finish up. But before we do, a couple of recommendations on some things we've been listening to. And Kenny, um, actually, no, I can't pick Kenny. It's not your turn. It's your turn, Philip. Go for you it. Know, Tell us what you've been listening to. Always my turn. Um, I'm going to recommend a podcast. I'm not sure whether you may have recommended it in the past when I can't remember. Um, it's a podcast called 42 to Doomsday. I have so, recommended it in the past. Uh, you have. So so I'm going to mm. do it now because I, I I don't know. Well, was it just not on for a while? Did they have a big break or something? But they've, They do have they've, gaps from time to time. They have gaps. Yeah. And so it's just one I've started listening to regularly the last few months. And it really is amusing me and I love their conversations I don't agree with all that they say all the time but I just love their manner it, it, it's particularly Australian and I think they, they call themselves the oldest Australian podcast I'm not sure if that's true or not um, but yeah, they say it so it must be true <laughs> because Australians never lie um, <laughs> is it the oldest or the most popular they call it oh I thought they said it was the oldest longest running not longest, longest running well, anyhow it's as I say it's it, I remember having a big gap and therefore not really getting into it when I got into podcasts. But more recently, I guess the last 12 months or so, they've been doing a lot more episodes and I've just really been enjoying it. And, it, you know, every time it drops into my feed, I get pretty excited. So, yeah, I'm just going to recommend the group from the boys from 42 to Doomsday. I, I don't know if you realise, but one of the hosts, his name is Rob. Uh, his full name is Robert Mammon. I think it's, I'm not sure if that's pronounced that right. But he has just released a book uh, through Candy Jar, one of the Brigadier books. He's written one of those. Well, there you go. So check that out. Yeah. yeah. Uh, can, okay. Can, um, Candy Jar's producing some nice stuff, can I just say? Mm. I, I, yep. I, I, I'm not buying it all because my, my budget is limited to everything being finished. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, the Candy Jar's really been putting out some nice stuff and the, the bits and pieces I've looked at, um, I've been intrigued by and yeah, good stuff. Okay, I might uh, save your recommendation, Kenny, till last, and I'll I'll recommend something that I've just listened to. It's, it's a documentary on Mary Whitehouse called Disgusted, and it is produced by Simon and Thomas Gurria. Uh, there's some readings from Mary Whitehouse's diaries that are that are peppered throughout the documentary, and these are done by Lisa Bauman as well. So, having grown up in the time when John Nathan Turner was celebrating every time Mary Whitehouse said something negative about the show because the ratings would go up. Uh, I was very interested in that. And it's uh, interesting to, to go back and get a bit more detail on the life and times of Mary Whitehouse. So that's on BBC Radio 4, still available. And I'll put some links in the show notes for that one. My understanding is they don't totally bag her out. They actually do recognise the fact that she had some important things to say in the end. Is that right? True. Absolutely true. Mm -hmm. It's very that's, fascinating. That's good because I, I do think, I mean, I, I think she went too far with Doctor Who and read stuff that didn't read into it. But I do think some of her broader work in terms of caring about society was, you know, good to be said. Anyhow, I, you, I'm, can, I'm, I'm, she, I'm she was that. born. She was born in the wrong time. I tell you, this is the age of outrage, and Mary Whitehouse would have just been a legend of Twitter at the moment, uh, being outraged at every single thing she possibly could. So You can imagine her um, tweets, can't you? <laughs> oh, mate, she would just be on fire. Um, okay, so that's my recommendation. Disgusted. 
by a uh, Mary Whitehouse documentary. Of course, Billy Connolly did once say about Mary Whitehouse, how can you take seriously somebody whose surname rhymes with toilet? Think about it. But yes, it's uh, it's very good. Yes, I've, um, I mean, at the moment, because we've got pieces of eighth back up and running, and I'm not actually, I'm giving a minor plug, but I am going to give a proper plug to something else, to what I've been listening to lately. We're back up and running, and we've been doing quite a lot of the Mary Shelley run with this Love current it. batch. We've also Love doing... It. Can I just say, more... on your Mary Shelley episode that I just listened to uh, on Mary's story, you were very diplomatic in not mentioning your thoughts on how it compared with the Villa Diodati, because I have some pretty strong opinions on that, and uh, you didn't come close to mentioning any. I think you handled it quite well, Kenny. <laughs> One does try to be a diplomat in these situations. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, different strokes for different folks. But it's great. We're actually um, planning our next series. We're actually going to do a whole load of BBC books. So nice. tracking down various authors. And my favourite little thing is doing little readings from them and bringing them to life with sound design. We've got Time Lord Victorious coming up. And we've got the last scene of that book with the Eighth Doctor, which has been all recorded. And if I can get my if I can get access to this laptop again, then I've got it on there all sound designed and ready to go to drop in. And it sounds quite good, but that's not what I'm going to recommend. I have recently discovered the wonders of the Doctor Who show from your fellow Antipodeans. And I just love the mix, the fact there's top five episodes, bottom five. And it's just done with so much fun. And it's great short 19, 20 minute bite sized episodes, which are great if you're in the shower or whatever, or having a shave. And generally, they're just so much fun. And they're just sort of good, get you thinking, sort of. What would I pick as my top five console rooms or things like that? And I just really, really love it. I, it's it's become one of my go-tos and do it. I'm sort of catching up and working my way through them, given there's quite a few, but I really enjoy just the fact there are different themes every episode and it's just really making me smile. So thanks to those guys. They've got a couple of mini podcasts. Uh, that one's called The List Makers, uh, which is mm -hmm. the one you're referring to. They've also... Got another one where they read out newsletters, uh, uh, letters to Doctor Who magazine and other fanzines and things like that and react with a guest or two. And then they have their main show once a month where they maybe talk about a season or some other topic. So, yeah, really, really good stuff. Really good stuff. Of course, Rob, the Doctor Who show has started the great big finish journey with us. But he's, uh, <laughs> he stalled at Necromantia. <laughs> he oh, I don't blame him. <laughs> and, and the moment he, he's, he's not prepared to go on because he was so horrified. <laughs> that, uh, and, and having got this well, should it, We should have told tweet. him, Philip, just skip I it. did. I told him not to listen to it. I said he should skip it. <laughs> and he's, oh, no. And he's just, he hit that. And he's not been able to go on yet. He's just been so damaged by that one show. Oh, uh, poor that's Rob. so sad because I was enjoying those episodes. I really love hearing somebody, you know, hearing Big Finish sometimes for the first time or re-listening to stuff and just getting those quick mini episodes that you were doing so please do. it's very unusual for us to do such short episodes it's strange <laughs> well that's the great thing about the podcast it can be as short or as long as you like and i've been enjoying that with pieces of eight we'll sort of keep the best stuff of the interviews try and keep as much of it in and just make them run to their natural length and as long as you know so we find it interesting then Beck and i'll keep it in so Indeed. that's our view on it excellent all right We'll finish up there. Uh, should I should I talk, Philip, about what's coming up next? Do you know what's coming up next? I have no idea what's coming up next. So do you want to tell let, me? <laughs> let me tell you what's coming up next. We we spoke recently with a new series actor, Simon Fisher Becker, who has appeared on a couple of Big Finish audios as well. So we're going to present that little chat to you next time on the Sirens of Audio. Um, so he's got some. He's got a very interesting life, Simon Fisher Becker. So fascinating to. We didn't because he hasn't done that much really on the on the total scale of things, but and and but our conversation did cover quite a lot, Philip. It really did, and we got one of the best bloopers ever out of him as well. Yeah, it was it was good. <laughs> <laughs> it was very good. Thank you so much, Kenny, for for coming back. We we have to not leave it so long next time between visits. Absolutely, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Always enjoy it chatting with you guys and we'll make time this has actually been done during i'm supposed to be working just now but uh, we won't tell anyone I don't care. 
No, if I can get this new job for the interview tomorrow, then absolutely it'll be like a case of who cares anyway. But no, I've thoroughly enjoyed it and it's always always a genuine honour and a pleasure to come on and chat with you guys because your enthusiasm is infectious and it, uh, it brightens my day. So thank you. Oh, thanks, Kenny. All right, thanks, Kenny. And thank you, Philip. We'll catch you all next time. Bye for now. Bye, everyone. This has been the Sirens of Audio episode 101, the fourth Doctor solo adventures with your hosts Philip Edney, Kenny Smith and Dwayne Bunny. Theme music by the Jackpot Golden Boys. Contact details, links to our podcast and video locations, social media and more can be found at sirensofaudio.com. Send us some audio feedback via anchor.fm slash sirensofaudio or drop us a line at sirensofaudio at gmail.com and give us your thoughts about our podcast or the latest audio drama you've been listening to and we'll share it on a future episode. And why should you do this? Well, the answer's simple, isn't it? Because audio drama 